give us the kind of boldness to ask you for things that, that we really need and that, and that you're waiting to give. Um, we lift up prayers for other people, people who are traveling, uh, people who, like, like Ron, who are um, in illness and or bedfast. Uh, for Matt and Tyler as they um, have experienced some, some violence really on their lives and uh, family of Judy Scott. Uh, for Leah's health issues, for Randall's stress test tomorrow. And uh, God, we, we pray for the people that, that Julie has ministry to, some of them uh, now without access. And, and God, we, we pray for Julie as she goes through the transition. And Lord, uh, anoint her ministry there. Lord, as you, you live in her, and, and where she works. Lord, and again, I, this time of year, I, I pray as we, we enter into this season, it's, it's a season of celebration, um, a season of thanksgiving, and, and yet it becomes so <laughs> unbelievably hectic for us at times. So it's got to slow us down, teach us how to still our own hearts, Teach us how to spend moments with you, uh, to take the moments that we have and, and to rest in you. God, as we continue on with some unknowns in our lives of, of what, what's going to happen in the, in the future, Lord, we, we do trust you as, as much as we can, but we, we need more. So, God, we do, we do pray for you to to live in us as you said that you would come and make your home, that you would pitch your tent in us. Uh, Lord, we just depend on you for, for that kind of faith and for that kind of walk. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you that we're not exactly sure why you chose us to reveal yourself to, but uh, Lord, we certainly do love you this morning. And uh, we want to be more faithful we want to be um, more true disciples to you. And so we know that that comes by emptying ourselves and giving ourselves to you. And, and that's the point where we are this morning. And so, so God, that's, that's our statement to you as we, we ask you to, um, as we say that we need you, for you to come and, and live fully in us. And it's in your, your name and your nature that we pray. Amen. Well, last week uh, was Vision Sunday, and we, we looked at how Jesus, remember, was talking about um, that he was always inviting to people and at the same time challenging to people, and that gave us maybe some new eyes about what it means to follow him and to live a life in the kingdom and a life that's abundant. And um, what, what it means is to, to hear what God's saying to us at any uh, specific time and then also to, to act on that. So it's those two things together. And in reality, all discipleship kind of comes down to those two things of, of hearing God and then, and then acting on it. And um, today I kind of hear God uh, telling us to follow him. It's not just about knowing the Bible, although that's extremely important, and, but it's about knowing God's voice and it's also about action. We, we've got to do something. We can't just hear it and know it but we've got to have the courage to act. There was a, a conference last month that uh, one of the speakers is getting quite a few waves going through Christianity. It was a Christian sociologist, and he had some what really is kind of shocking information of something that's going on in the church. And at this time in our culture, as the church is losing its, its uh, kind of political power and influence, it seems like sometimes in their culture, we're always talking about how there's less, fewer millennials in the church, or fewer young people. And this guy wasn't talking about millennials. He was talking about the Dunners, he called them, the D-O-N-E-R-S. And these are uh, people that are leaving the church who are influential leaders. Uh, they're mature Christians. They've been around the church a long time. 
I mean, they're old people like me, and they're, uh, that, was, that was a joke, and they're, <laughs> and they're leaving the church, and the reason, and of course it's not massive numbers, but it's a it's very important thing that's happening, and the reason that they're leaving the church is, <clears throat> as one of them said, he's tired of plop, pray, and pay. You come to church, you plop down, you pray, and you pay, and you go. And then they've gone, he said, he's gone through countless sermons and Bible studies, and they feel that they've just heard it all. And they've just gotten full. And one said, I'm tired of being lectured to. I'm just tired of having some guy tell me what to do. Instead, I want to play, and I want to participate. Some find that reality that uh, leaders are leaving to be, you know, uh, because of faith is not tangible to them, you know, that that is discouraging. And I, I find it really ins insightful. I think somebody's, I really applaud somebody that had the, the kind of guts and courage to bring this out for the church to talk about it. Um, because I'm thankful that someone had that courage. Uh, <clears throat> we, we may know what is what we would call the Protestant Reformation, but the church is always in the midst of Reformation. The church is always in the midst of change. It, it never stays the same. And there seems to be this, this constant tension between things like being relevant, being able to be heard and understood in our culture on one hand, and then, you know, over on the other hand is being a part of the world system and getting so entangled with things that we lose our way. So it, the church is just constantly changing. And with that in mind, this Sunday I wanted to look at, at the vitality and the courage of the, the early Christian church uh, in the New Testament. I've chosen a passage from Acts 4. Most of you know this. You've seen this. Where we're going to begin is actually Acts uh, 4.13, which is the conclusion of the confrontation between Peter and John <clears throat> that they had with some... Uh, Jewish authorities soon after Pentecost, and you know the story. They're on their way to the temple to pay to to pray, uh, and uh, I said that wrong to pray. And there's this guy. We learn later that he's about 40 years old and he's lame and he's a professional beggar. And that's okay. That was all right in their their era. That was had no social security, so he's on his way. You know, he's on the way to the temple, and they go by him and. He asked for a donation, and they say, we don't have any gold or silver, but what we have, we'll give you. Uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And the man stands up, and uh, he does more than walk. He's kind of dancing and running around, and there's this huge celebration. It causes this big problem. Everybody's going, oh, my gosh, you know, these, these guys, they're doing the same thing that Jesus did. And... Um, it was then that uh, Peter preached his second sermon. The first sermon that he preached, uh, 3,000 men were come to faith, and uh, plus probably some young people and some women. This time he preaches again, and he's some preacher, 5,000 people, 5,000 men, you know, come to faith. And, and because of that, uh, they're thrown in jail. I mean, you just can't do that. Just can't, can't have that kind of public disturbance. And the Jewish authorities, the same men that uh, had orchestrated the, the crucifixion of Jesus, they throw him in jail, and he gets another opportunity to preach to the Jewish council. And so Peter, full of the Holy Spirit then, uh, says, This man was healed in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified. Boy, I can see his finger out. Whom you crucified and God raised from the dead. And then he said, there's salvation and no other name. So we pick this up, Acts 4, 13. Now when they, that's the Jewish council, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council... They conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For, for that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Excuse me, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. 
But in order that it may be spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in his name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate among the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. For while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Long passage, but it's great. I, I just love some things in that passage. The first thing that I like is that they recognize them as having been with Jesus. I, I just think that that's just amazing. Uh, that they had the same boldness that Jesus had. They spoke with the same kind of authority that he did. Uh, God healed a man through their boldness, and they knew who they were, and they were absolutely confident that the risen Lord would be working through them, and they these guys had not been to seminary. They were not trained. They were not professionals. They were fishermen by trade. And before Jesus called them to be his disciples, and they had, they had no resumes. They had no degrees. They were not eloquent speakers. And as Paul would say later, God chose foolish things to shame the wise. So the church started with some uneducated common men and women who had courage and boldness. When, when people are usually asked why they don't share their faith, they say, I just don't know what to say. I don't know anything. I don't know the Bible well enough. But, you know, how much do you need to know? <laughs> in places where there's been revival, like in the third world, in China and in Africa, uneducated men and women, but they're courageous They've got, they've got desire. They've got zeal. In America, I've seen the opposite of this verse. People are very educated, but I'm amazed at their lack of courage and the lack of boldness. Peter and John were bold because, I think, because they were called people. They knew who they were in Christ. They knew what their mission was. They knew why they were on this earth. Francis Chan, a uh, pastor in California, um, I, I really um, like his stuff most of the time, and it's, I don't know him, he's just, uh, it's not like, you know, Don and Francis or anything, but um, he's, he's got some good books, some good speaker, and he's a pastor out there, and he's, he's launched a couple churches, and he told the story how when he was a young pastor, he went to a conference, and the guy was speaking, and the guy was talking about this Christmas pageant that he put on at their church, and it's this huge thing, and they spent thousands and thousands of dollars, and they had all these animals and stuff, and it was, you know, like a Broadway production kind of thing, and they packed the church night after night, and everybody came to see this big production, and um, people would give, hundreds and hundreds of people would give 15 hours a week for months and months uh, to, to rehearse this and to be in this big pageant. And when it was all over, uh, young Francis, uh, he, Chan went up to the pastor and he said, he says, I've got a question. He said, what if all those people rehearsing at church spent 10 to 15 hours a week building relationships with their neighbors to tell them about Jesus? Wouldn't that accomplish more? And wouldn't it be free? 
Well, the guy said, well, you know, you're right. It would, but no one's willing to do that. So Chan agreed as a young pastor, but he said, but I didn't agree long. He said, I agreed that people couldn't change then as a young pastor, but later on I changed my mind. Of course, he's, he's launched a couple church, the churches that are really strong in discipleship. You know, but how rare that is, how rare it is. Instead, we say, oh, you won't talk to your neighbors? Well, that's, that's fine. Uh, just show up to church and dress like a reindeer. That's all you need to do. Maybe somebody will come see how you look like a reindeer, you know. And we'll say, we're reaching the world for Christ. Excuse my sarcasm. But that's, in essence, what the church often does here. We, we wouldn't want you to do something that would make you uncomfortable, you know, to actually talk to your neighbors. The next thing that strikes me here is when they're back with the rest of the believers and they pray for God to give them courage to speak God's word with boldness. And, the finish, and when they finish praying, the place that they're praying is shaken. It's an earthquake, you know, is what, is what happens. It's just not a circumstantial earthquake. It's a God quake, all right? God shakes the place to let them know, hey, I hear what you're saying. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm here with you. I'm going I'm to answer your prayer. Speak my word with boldness. Hey, have you ever prayed for boldness to speak the word of God? Now, bold doesn't mean mean. Bold doesn't mean that you're just, you know, one of those guys. Bold is not arrogant. Bold means that you speak when it would logically seem to be a time to keep silent out of fear of maybe being embarrassed, okay? Boldness believes that God's about to do something and you need to announce it. We, we live at a time in our culture where if you're bold and if you're assertive, about what you consider to be the truth, then you're thought to be usually prejudiced, intolerant, maybe even hateful. That's just, just assumed if you're bold. And sadly, a minority of Christians has kind of given us that reputation, but, but the whole idea of hiding your beliefs and never telling anyone, I mean, stop and think about this. This is really ridiculous to say, I'm never going to tell anybody what, you know, what drives my life, the core of my life. Uh, we are often accused, Christians are accused, of trying to convert people. Yeah. Well, who isn't trying to convert someone? You, you're all going to be converted by something. Everyone is converted by something. Atheists convert people. Agnostics convert people. Nihilists convert people. Every person has been influenced and converted by some kind of philosophy or worldview. All of us are. And yet, as Christians, we think, oh, I shouldn't try to influence anyone. They might believe me, and that would cause a problem. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Parents sometimes say that they want to let their children decide for themselves without any influence. Impossible. Well, we can't not influence our children. Our children are going to be influenced by something. No one lives in a theological or philosophical vacuum. Can't be done. And the culture is constantly influencing us, constantly trying to convert us to something. But often today, we're not bold with God's word. We do not speak up, but we actually hide what we know because we think that if we dare mention Jesus, that we'll be considered to be intolerant or non-intellectual, perhaps even hateful. And we cannot be bold for God and be accepted by the world at the same time. That's just the way it is. John 15, 19, just one passage where Jesus speaks to this. He says, if you were of the world and the world would love you, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now, John later in 1 John three thirteen said, don't be surprised if the world hates you. Hates, that, that's a strong language, you know. And yet our expectations is that we can make everybody happy if we just won't speak up. Ridiculous. That doesn't mean that we should be loud, that we should be, you know, a bullhorn guy on a soapbox downtown asking everybody if they're saved or if, they don't, if they're going to go to, to hell today. That do, that's not what that means, you know. But Peter and John were recognized as being disciples not because they had on Christian T-shirts 
you know, or they had huge crosses, huge bling crosses to show who they were, all right? They were recognized because they had the authority of Jesus Christ, and they had been called out, and they believed what they were saying. They knew the risk, but they also knew that, that without the risk, the Holy Spirit would never use them. I can just see Peter and John, you know, being asked by the lame man for money and them saying, you know, um, in the name of the higher power in which you believe, stand and walk. It's not going to happen. And you got you to get the name of Jesus out there, right? And Jesus is always the one that causes the problems. His name is the one that causes the problem. And we can't avoid that. We can't get around that. We have to loose that name. And then it says, and they were all filled with the Spirit, and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. The Holy Spirit is present when we are bold and courageous and we step out of our comfort zones. Remember that Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter? We, we need a Comforter when we dare do something that is risky, courageous, and we become uncomfortable. If you are comfortable right now, if you're not taking any risk, you don't need the Comforter. But when you step out in that risky place, it's then that you need the Holy Spirit. And we must uh, connect courageous acts, I think, with the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure that we think of those two things together. Most of the time we talk about the Holy Spirit and we think, well, we're going to get in a room and we're all going to pray and we're going to sing some great songs. And, and then the Spirit's going to come and we'll, we'll feel enlightened and we'll get blessed. And the Spirit, you know, we'll all be in the Spirit so sing two more songs. You know, we're not quite there yet. <sighs> Being filled with the Spirit is a necessity if we're doing something for God. The Western church, we, we, we think that the Spirit is here when we're all together in the same room. And look at this, act, this instance in Acts. The house was shaken when they prayed for boldness. They said, God, send us out. Send us out to the place where there's some danger. You know, and God says, I'll do that. I'm going to shake the house to let you know that I'm going to send you out into a dangerous place. Send us out where your spirit must show up. And it's then that they're filled with the spirit. I, I, think, I think I can speak for us all that we all want to experience the, the, the fullness of the spirit in our lives. But we have to remember why the Holy Spirit is given. Uh, it says in Acts 1.8, you will receive power, words of Jesus, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Okay? You're going to receive the Holy Spirit and you're going to be sent out to there and further and further into the ends of the world. Okay? <clears throat> if you never really experienced the Holy Spirit, then ask yourself, am I out making disciples? Am I being bold? Am I being a witness? Or am I just trying to feel the Spirit? You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not kicking that feeling the Spirit thing. I'm just saying that we don't often equate being bold and risky with the work of the Spirit, and that is where He usually acts. Would you like to experience the Holy Spirit? Would you like to know the presence of God? And do something. Be courageous. Step into that place where you, you display your faith, where, where you show what God's doing. Pray for boldness to share God's word. Do something dangerous for God. Get out of the church. Get out of your homes. Get out of your comfortable place. Now, uh, I could... I, I'm going to close here, and I could give you some examples of uh, doing that. But I want us to take 10 minutes. Okay, we're going to go on the weird side again today. All right, we do this every once in a while. We're going to take 10 minutes to talk to each other. All right? This is what Don does when he runs out of the end of the sermon. So, no, not really. Okay? So if, if you're here for the first time, I know this is a little, little strange. Uh, you don't have to say anything. Um, you know, you can, you, everybody has, always has a right to go, I don't have anything.
okay? Uh, I never want anybody to feel pressured. But what we're going to do is we're going to get in groups four, five, or six, probably less than six, and you don't have to talk. But here's the questions, okay? Uh, questions are up there. Share a time when you stepped out in boldness and then experienced the Holy Spirit's power. I'm sure somebody's got one of those in the room. Share a time when you shared God's word, a truth, or a witness about Jesus, and you were rejected. Okay, you got one of those? Or share a time when someone else was bold in sharing with you. So it doesn't have to be you. It could be someone else. All right, let's kick that around for about 10 minutes, and then, and then we'll close and, and worship some more. All right? Go. Thank you.